glad to have you here. Um, we're excited about a lineup of, of things that we've been planning, the, and today we're having our first event. So let me just introduce myself. My name is Jeremy Rinker, and I teach in Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of North Carolina Greensboro. And I have been a part of the conference planning committee for the PJSA as we moved online. So as many of you know, we had planned to have a conference in Florida around this time, actually, a couple weeks from now, we'd be converging on Florida. And, uh, you know, something happened that made that not happen. I think we all know what that is. Um, I want to just take a moment before we get started to thank my fellow members of the PJSA conference planning committee who late last spring jumped on and 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 kind of re reconverted an entire conference and moved it online and created a really exciting lineup. Um, we're excited to have a number of um, a number of, of exciting speakers, events, panels happening in the month of September, October, and November. So September, we've started out with the kind of broad theme of restorative justice. In October, we're gonna be talking about uh, storytelling and social, social justice issues. So, and, and, and so we think these things dovetail really nicely. And in November, we'll be talking about polarization, which was actually the original theme of our, of our planned in-person conference. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Michael Lodenthal, the executive director of PJSA, who's, who really kind of corralled us together as a small conference planning committee. I won't name all the conference planning committee members, but you know who you are and you know the amount of time we spent on this platform organizing, um, organizing this event. And so we're, we're just thankful for, for, for Michael and his kind of leadership in doing that work. I also want to give a, a quick shout out to Abigail City. Um, Abby has, is a student at UNCG and she has been helping the conference planning committee for much of that time. And she's done already put a lot of time in. And so um, I just wanted to say those things right off the bat. And, and Abigail is going to be the one, if you're having issues with the microphone or need to be unmuted or anything like that, everybody I hope knows by now how to use Zoom a little bit. You can actually chat straight with one person. So if you could chat straight with Abigail City, um, C-I-T-T-Y is her last name, and she's the co-host now of the uh, of the. Um, of the event today. So you can you can actually just chat straight to her if you're having issues while you're online. If you get bumped off, I would say make sure that you send a um, a note to info. You can use email and send a note to info at peace uh, peaceandjusticestudies.org or sorry it's peace it's peaceandjusticestudies.org, right? Is our email and no it's peace peacejusticestudies.org. Okay Michael's shaking his head no. So no and in the middle. So peacejusticestudies.org. Uh, there it is in the chat box. Um, and if you, yeah, if you have a problem, you get bumped off or whatever, Michael Lodenthal will be monitoring that email and can let you back in. A couple of other kind of quick, quick housekeeping things before I quickly introduce and get to what we all came to listen to, which is uh, David's talk. Um, just a couple of other quick um, quick things to think about as we, as we uh, kind of think about ho housekeeping. I'll facilitate some conversation after, after David Hooker is done with, with his talk. If you have clarifying questions, feel free to send them to me and I can, I can raise them. So you can either send them directly to me or you can put them in the chat to everyone either way. And I can kind of gently stop David in his talk and, and ask him for clear, you know, to clarify something that he said. But otherwise, we'll kind of keep questions towards the end, and I will monitor those questions as they come in and try to get to as much of them as I can. If you would prefer to say the question yourself, then um, we can we can we can work that. We can transfer, you know, the, we can open up your microphone and let you let you speak and ask the question directly. If you want to do that, you can just put a kind of a question mark in the chat box to me or to the full group. And I'll try to monitor that and, and work with Abby to, to get that to, to happen as well. Um, the other thing I should say is we are going to be recording. We already are recording. And so if you, for some reason, don't want to be seen, you can, you can disable your camera. Um, 
because you will appear on the recording otherwise. Also, everything in the chat box um, is, um, is gonna be in the recording. So be, be aware of that and try to use the chat box uh, sparingly if possible. I think that's pretty much it for housekeeping. If there's other things that I'm missing, others let me know. Um, so let me go ahead and, and, and do a quick introduction to David uh, Anderson Hooker, who's here today to present his work entitled, Can Restorative Justice Transform Historical Harms or Dismantle Present Day Systematic Syndemic Oppressions? Question mark. We've asked David Hooker or Dr. Hooker uh, to help frame some of the conceptual and practical issues involved in the work of restorative justice as we're having this whole conference over the, the, the month of September focused on restorative justice. We thought he would be an ideal person to help frame some of these conceptual issues and ideas around restorative justice and take a critical approach to, to justice as a whole. Justice is, of course, uh, extremely complicated, and I look forward to Dr. Hooker helping us uh, parse out the various ways we talk about justice and peace and conflict studies. Is it transformative, restorative, uh, transitional, trauma-informed, healing, therapeutic, dot, dot, dot. That, that list could go on. Dr. Hooker is an associate professor of practice of conflict transformation and peace building at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies uh, at the University of Notre Dame. Hooker has worked uh, with communities, governments, international NGOs, and civil society organizations on post-conflict community building, environmental justice, and other issues of public policy and social justice. He has managed multi-party conflicts, conducted workshops, and consulted across the U.S. and around the world. Dr. Hooker is also a lawyer who has represented the state of Georgia as an assistant attorney general. He has taught graduate courses in negotiation, mediation, conflict resolution, conflict analysis, trauma healing, and conflict transformation at Eastern Mennonite University. From 2010 to 2015, Hooker was a senior fellow for community engagement strategies at the University of Georgia's J.W. Fanning Institute for Leadership Development. He is president and principal consultant of Counter Stories Consulting, LLC, where his work focuses on narrative alignment for civic community and faith leaders. Hooker is a graduate of Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Emory University School of Law, and Emory University's uh, Chandler School of Theology. He earned his PhD from Tilburg University in the Netherlands. Um, I, I just will end by introducing him by saying I first encountered David as he came to Greensboro doing some of the work he does with Counter Stories, the LLC that, that he runs. And we were organizing and he was helping organize and facilitate dialogue and conversation around police and community accountability. These were powerful conversations that we had and he's a master facilitator that raises important questions in an open and caring way, constantly reminding us of, of the change to collectively, of the, sorry, of the charge to collectively envision Greensboro, where I live, uh, as a place that all citizens can feel safe, respected, and heard. David's helped foster deep connections in this racially charged su Southern city over many years. He's actually been in, been in and out of Greensboro probably longer than I have. And I look forward to hearing him uh, speak and having him here in Greensboro again, although he's not really here in Greensboro. So David, with that, I will pass off to you and I welcome you and thank you for, for being with us today. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank everybody for being here. This is really exciting for me. Um, I, I recognize that this month's focused subject for the PJSA is on restorative justice and next month is about narrative and because a lot of my work is focused in narrative from time to time as we're talking probably more so in the questions and wrestling period than in the direct talk you'll hear me refer to issues around narrative because I think that that is primarily where um, the work the work is. So um, I want to 
just start off, share the screen. I hope this is working for me. I'm co-host, I think, at this point. So let's see if I can share a screen and what that does in terms of view. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Where do we go? So is that somebody will clue me in that that's, yeah. um, that we can see that? We can. Okay. I won't stay here all day, but I'm here in the screen. I just want to make sure. So the question that I'm posing for this session is this. Is restorative justice even in its ideal form, I, I recognize those who are practicing restorative justice recognize that there are a lot of things that people have uh, put forth, a lot of programs and activities that people have put forth that misappropriate the name or the con, the, uh, the description of being restorative. Not everything that goes by the name restorative is restorative. We don't have to parse those out for today. I just want to ask, in even its ideal forms, is restorative justice philosophically, practically suitable as a framework with which to respond to issues of structural, systemic, multi-generational, racialized harms like those experienced by African, African descendants in the United States. Said a couple of things to the side for a second. I realized that this same set of questions, can restorative justice serve as a proper framework for just addressing other historical harms, could go to many other communities, to many other contexts, to the indigenous communities, to other contexts, both in and out of the United States. This isn't kind of a xenophobic, approach. This is to create a case to raise the question. I really want to talk about the possibilities for restorative justice and also eventually transformative justice. And so we're just raising the case. Um, so this isn't, this isn't like an all lives matter conversation, not that all lives don't, but this isn't that conversation, right? We're trying to create a case where we look, we're presenting a case where we look at the presence of multi-generational historical harms that were racialized against black and brown body people in the United States. Because blackness is best understood as a social construction denoting a political condition that reflects degrees of marginalization a social construction denoting a political condition that reflects degrees of marginalization. It is not genetic, biological, morphological. And because at the intersections of marginalization, gender nonconforming people are often the most marginalized, I will sometimes talk about black, brown, bodied, and gender nonconforming people. But that's the context that we're working in. And the question is, how, if at all, does restorative justice suit in applying in these conditions, right? So, and then to further the, the question, I want to push it even further because this is the Peace and Justice Studies Association. I want to push it even further to ask if justice, if there's even a justice paradigm, is systemic a structural racism, a racialized historical harm, is it properly framed within any justice paradigm, right? That becomes our question. So the context for our conversation, we're, we're gonna create a play, we're gonna create a case. And so the place where the case happens is Chicago. The case itself is the context and the conditions which caused or required the creation of, necessitated the creation of the Chicago 
Torture Justice Center. So this is just a quick, quick warning. Early on, I'm going to be describing some of the circumstances that produced the need for Chicago Torture Justice Center. And so some of the descriptions in the early, early part of the talk, I'm not trying to be overly dramatic, but some of the descriptions may be disturbing for a, a few people. And so just, um, just be aware that that's the case. It won't last a long time. So if you need to kind of shut down a step away just for self-care and then come right back three to five minutes into the talk, come right back. So this is the case. The context that caused the, created the need for the Chicago Torture Justice Center. Paradoxical curiosity. John Paul Lederach in his moral imagination tells us that paradoxical curiosity is an essential capacity for the everyday peace builder. Paradoxical curiosity, the capacity to hold two distinguishable and even diametrically opposed ideas in your mind at the same time without doing damage to either one of them. And so this is our day's test for paradoxical curiosity. Hold in your mind the image that you have of Chicago, the gleaming heart of the Midwest, America's second city. Hold that in mind and at the same time know that this was taking place in the shadows of Chicago. On February 16th, Andrew Wilson met Dale Coventry, the public defender appointed to represent him in his murder trial. Wilson told Coventry about torture and the public defender arranged to have more pictures taken instructing the photographer to pay particular attention to Wilson's ears, chest, and thighs, where the abrasions were especially raw. That evening, the medical examiner at the Cook County Jail Hospital facility, Dr. John Raba, examined Wilson's injuries for two consecutive days. Afterwards, Raba sent a letter to the superintendent of the Chicago Police Department this is what he said, Mr. Superintendent, I examined Mr. Andrew Wilson on February 15th and 16th, 1982. He had multiple bruises, swellings and abrasions on his face and head. His right eye was battered and had superficial lacerations. Andrew Wilson had several linear blisters on his right thigh right cheek and anterior chest, which were consistent with radiator burns. He stated that he had been cuffed to a radiator and pushed into it. He also stated that electrical shock had been administered to his gums, lips, and genitals. All those injuries occurred prior to his arrival at the jail. There must be a thorough investigation of this alleged brutality. Sincerely, John Raba, medical director. At some point later, it would be determined that Mr. Wilson, who had been accused of murdering two Chicago police officers, was one of only one, he was only, he was one of only a score of black and brown body people, mostly men, who suffered the types of abuse and treatment that in other circumstances would rise to the level of war crimes or crimes against humanity. But in Chicago, America's second city, those activities would be unremarkable for at least two decades. There's some record to indicate that this was a pattern in practice for over 50 years by the Chicago Police Department. And even when these practices and the results were brought to light, it seemed to not create any significant uproar. In Chicago, mostly on the majority black side of town from 1971 to 1992, a so-called rogue unit 
of the Chicago Police Department, concentrated in Area 2 and 3 under the direction and supervision of Police Commander John Burge. conducted a reign of terror using enhanced interrogation techniques that Burge had mastered while he was a soldier in Operation Phoenix in the Vietnam War. Burge and many officers under his direct command extracted confessions or forced individuals to agree to testify against others or become criminal informants. There's well-established incontrovertible records establishing that to coerce confessions, Burge's officers beat suspects with telephone books, flashlights, batons, baseball bats. Some of the victims described being burned either with their flesh pressed against radiators or having cigarettes put out on their bare skin. Some were nearly suffocated with plastic typewriter covers, other torture survivors, reported having guns put to their head, in their mouth, or being struck or shot with cattle prods. These actions, many other humane modalities uh, were repeated, they were repeatedly used in ways calculated to degrade, to dehumanize, and ultimately to break the will of those who were targeted. And even though there was a consistent hue and cry over the course of 30 years, we have, rep, we have records and history of at least 30 years of protest and petitioning to local government. These actions went unaddressed and were unremarkable. And during that period, many, many people were sentenced to anywhere from five years in jail to life without the possibility of parole all the way to being placed on Illinois death row. I think this is, the, the protest went on so long because the people who were raising the concerns lacked what um, Miranda Fricker, what Pro Professor Miranda Fricker would describe as testimonial authority. People didn't believe them just by virtue of who they were, black and brown body, many women, some elderly, young, uh, south side of Chicago and who they were raising the claim on behalf of. And even when groups like Amnesty International and We Charge Genocide and the People's Law Office got involved, people either didn't, it's like boys in the hood, they didn't, sh they didn't show or they didn't care. They didn't know or they didn't care, right? So this went on for years. In 1991, we're just building a case. We're still going to ask this question about the, the value of restorative justice, but we're just building a case. Give me a few minutes to finish building this case. In 1991, Chicago acknowledged that Byrd had tortured Andrew Wilson. In 1993, they voted, the Chicago Police Board voted to terminate Byrd with his pension, right? Um, that same year, the Fraternal Order of Police organized with the plan to have a float in the South Side Irish Parade to have a float in honor of Burge and four of the other officers who have been accused of torture and brutality. Wisdom prevailed. The, the float didn't actually happened, but they had organized it and arranged the resources to make it happen. Um, in 2010, Burge was convicted in federal court, but only of destruction of property, obstruction of justice and perjury charges, and then uh, was tried in a civil suit as well. He was sentenced to five years in prison, but it wasn't for any acts of torture or brutality. It was only for lying about acts of torture and brutality. He was released from prison, um, and in February 15, 2015, he was released from house arrest. He moved to Florida, and interestingly, on the second day of the trial of Jason Van Dyke, who was the police officer who had shot 
and killed Laquan McDonald. Burge died peacefully at his home in Florida at the age of 70. June 18th, Andrew Wilson, the guy who I described as torture, his brother, Jackie, um, who had also been charged with uh, murder, was released from prison after 36 years because the judge ruled that his confession had been involuntarily obtained. And it wasn't until 2015 where there was an ordinance passed that the advocates, once they got the attention and Burge was fired and other officers were removed, the advocates who were raising this claim didn't stop. They kept pressing and they pressed the city seeking reparations on behalf of those who had survived torture and the Burge regime. And there was a historic reparations ordinance that was passed in Chicago. Among other things, the reparations ordinance acknowledges that the former police officer and his detectives engaged in acts of torture, physical abuse, and coercion of African men and women. And then it provided many things. The reparations ordinance provided for many things, a formal apology, the creation of a torture reparations commission that will be responsible for administering financial reparations to torture survivors. It created a center on the south side of Chicago, which is the Chicago Torture Justice Center. It provides that all the torture survivors and their families be allowed to enroll in city colleges, tuition free. Uh, they were creating a curriculum. We are creating a curriculum that's embedded and taught in the public schools in Chicago so that students are aware of this. Um, and then there are ongoing law enforcement hearings to test whenever somebody claims that they're a survivor of torture, even though they only have enough money to do a certain number of years. So it'll take about 20 years to be able to hear all of the claims of those who are in prison because they are there for torture. And none of those who are there because of a confession or testimony from somebody else who was tortured to confess or to bear witness against them. So those folks aren't necessarily included, but the ordinance also provides $20 million to finance the P Chicago Police Torture Reparation Commission, the center, the creation of a curriculum, and the creation of public memorial funds. Reparations were won to some extent, and the Torture Justice Center and the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial uh, Program have been established. The question though remains for us. So this is the case. And I like this Chicago Torture Justice Center case because in many ways, it is a microcosm, a condensed version of what racialized, structural, syndemic oppression looks like. What structural harm, direct harm, the the cultural harm that sits underneath that makes it okay to abuse, to disabuse, to violate the human rights of an entire swath of people, to reign terror, uh, that there is state-sponsored violence and state complicity when the violence is directed from citizens against black, um, against black and brown bodied people. This is all part of, these are all uh, kind of a condensed version of the microcosm of conditions that we're trying to discover whether in cases like this, there is such a thing as a restorative framework, even a transformative framework, or any justice paradigm that is suitable to address these conditions. If you want to know more about um, the police torture case, there is an entire archive for it that's set up at the University of Chicago. It was established in 2016. The Posen Center at the University of Chicago has the archives of all of this and continues to collect the archives of uh, this event. And so it's worthwhile. If it's something that you're new to or just discovering, want to learn more about,
there's plenty of material. But the question for us, uh, oh, the one thing about the Posen Center is when they say that they create this archive, they say that it's because this is a closed episode in the history of Chicago. What we know is they acknowledged from 71 to 92, there's records and other indicators that it was at least 50 years. So it had at least been going on since probably the 40s or 50s. But then what we know is there was another report that said that at least 3,500 Americans, this is after Burge. This is still Chicago, that gleaming city on the hill. This is paradoxical curiosity. You're holding these two images in your mind, the Miracle Mile, the beautiful waterworks, the downtown, the gleaming city, and then somewhere in the shadows of that city, at least 3,500, some records suggest as many as 7,000 black and brown bodied people were detained by Chicago police in an abandoned warehouse, and they were using it for secretive interrogation facilities. They disappeared, folks, and we don't imagine that all of those torture techniques that had been previously applied have gone away. So this isn't a period in history. This is ongoing historical moment, and there's a cultural underline, there's a cultural violence, there's an undergirding that allows this to happen, even while uh, the beauty of the city of Chicago uh, goes uh, un undaunted. So that's our case. I actually, and even though that's the case, I don't really want to talk about, so I'm hoping that our questions don't get too detailed in the workings of the Torture Justice Center. I think it's important to talk about them. And I would say, shout out A. Slim Pulley, uh, Cindy Iger, you know, folks at the Torture Justice Center, uh, they're the co-executive directors, are doing amazing work. And there are a lot of the survivors and the families of the survivors that are doing amazing work there. We could talk a bit about that. But what I really want to ask is whether this is the kind of case that is framed well to apply a restorative philosophy or a restorative set of practices. Is restorative justice, can restorative justice transform historical harms and dismantle present day systematic and syndemic oppressions? So this is, these are some of the aspects that I'm thinking are part of uh, the nature of racialized historical harms that we're trying to find whether there's a justice paradigm that would address them. There are direct harms. And oftentimes restorative justice is good at identifying direct harms and repairing relationships or creating some accountability in relationship to direct harms. But there are also compounding generational physical, spiritual, psychological wounds that compound over the generations. And so it's wounding that gets passed from one to the next, from, as they say, in the faith, from heart to heart and breast to breast. And there are ripple effects. And so some who are directly harmed, then they have a way of directly harming or indirectly harming others. And even just seeing the harm done to some has a ripple effect on families, on family structures, on communities, on community structures. There's a diminished economic position. And so we recognize that there's kind of a correlative association with poverty, with so many other, uh, with so many other aspects or so many other direct wounds and impacts and limitations that are created just by the ongoing association with poverty. There are, of course, cycles, direct harm and unresolved trauma create cycles of internal and external victimhood and violence, which all of which shapes identity narratives, our understanding of our past, our understanding of the present, our understanding of what's possible in the future, all of this 
creates invisible, intangible, and immeasurable effects. This is the nature of racialized historical harms of sy systemic and structural racism. And so the question is whether restorative justice, and so what I need you to hear is I'm not having this conversation to critique restorative justice, to criticize restorative justice. I was uh, a active part of a much earlier movement, an earlier way, the alternative dispute resolution way where there was mediation and uh, other forms of dispute resolution, community justice centers and the like. And what we weren't necessarily willing to do was be fair to the intervention. So we presented mediation as a panacea, like it would solve so many things. It would bring justice to everybody. And uh, there were ways in which by overselling, overstating the case, we actually probably did exactly what Laura Nader suggested that we might do, which was to trade justice for harmony. In the same way, there are some who make claims about restorative justice and its capacities to do things that I'm not sure that it's capable or even intended of doing. So when I, when I teach a class, I teach at the doctoral level, master's level, undergraduate level, I teach practices of peace building. But in everything, when we're thinking about evaluating our practice, we always want to be fair to the intervention. You don't want to ask it to do something. You don't want to evaluate it for doing something that it's incapable of doing. So the question is, can restorative justice transform historical harms and dismantle present day systematic and syndemic oppressions? If so, then let's figure out together how I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about how it may do that. And if not, it's just a matter of determining what justice approach there may be that could do that. And if there is no justice approach, maybe this isn't a justice question at all. I've used this term a couple of times. I've said syndemic, syndemic oppression, syndemic theory, and not everybody is familiar with that. We're familiar with what's happening right now because we're having this conversation virtually because we're in the midst of a global pandemic, right? A pandemic is an epidemic that crosses national boundaries. So if, if it crosses national and continental boundaries, an epidemic becomes pandemic. A syndemic happens when you have multiple interlocking epidemics. So in some ways, it's the linkage of multiple uh, epidemics happening. And the thing is, when they intersect in a particular context, they produce something that's never been produced before and may not actually intersect in the same way in other contexts. Context is always decisive. And so when multiple epidemic forces interact, they create and produce certain outcomes, certain symptoms, certain uh, manifestations that don't have a historic predecessor. They, 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 haven't, they don't have a previous occurrence because they only could occur in this time, in this moment, in this particular context and way with this particular overlap of epidemic occurrences. And what Beach and others identify or tell us is that interventions that target single conditions, maybe, they say maybe, they're cautious, I would say are most likely to be inadequate when the multiple conditions are co-occurring. Thus, we use a syndemic framework to help identify the kinds of intervention strategies where there are multiple co-occurring conditions. And so if you think about the multiple co-occurring conditions that are taking place, the economic, the physical, the direct wounding, the environmental injustices that are often happening, the, all of the different social uh, psychological and spiritual wounding that's happening and assaults that are happening at so many levels over so many levels of organization from individual to relational to family to national to international and across time 
when you think of those, then you have to think syndemically about how to intercede. And to prevent syndemic, you have to control not each affliction, but also the forces that tie those afflictions together. The forces that tie those afflictions together. And so you have multiple sources of assault and the cultural violence that undergirds that is quite racialized and engendered is what holds them together. And so the question that we're proposing is can restorative justice, is it a proper framework if this is what we're trying to tackle? This isn't a new question. So it's new, but um, at, at least as far back as 2011, uh, when Mary Louise uh, Frampton, who was one of my, who was my partner in Greensboro, Jeremy mentioned the work we were doing in Greensboro, Mary Louise Frampton, who was my uh, partner in Greensboro, was the director of the Thelton Henderson Center for Social Justice at Bolt Hall at the law school at Berkeley. And we, she hosted a conversation where we were trying to look at whether restorative justice had the power to undo structural racism. Now, at the time, the idea was, can it just, were there ways that restorative justice programs that are situated inside of institutions that are clearly uh, infected with structural racism, educational institutions, the prison system, social services, if we infuse restorative justice, can we first expose structural racism and then use that exposure as part of the pathway to the undoing? So we've been doing, having this conversation for uh, coming up on a decade now and probably others even longer than that. So what I wanna do, I should stop for a second. I should stop for a second and ask Jeremy, have any questions come in that I ought to attend to before I move into this next phase of this conversation? Yeah, no, no clarifying questions, no. no. No clarifying questions, okay. Hopefully there are at least a couple of questions that I'm, I'm imagining I have at least offended one or two or stepped on somebody's <laughs> toes already. That is the hope. If not, I will speed up. I'll try and do it, try and do better in this next stage. What I'm going to do is I just want to talk briefly about um, a few approaches to justice. So this is the question. Um, justice, I, I guess there are all these different portals or approaches to justice. I talk about them as portals or approaches as though justice is a thing. Maybe justice isn't just one thing. And so social justice is a different thing from racial justice is a different thing. And these approaches to achieving that um, transformative, retributive, distributive justice, maybe they're all trying to achieve something different. That would be helpful to know. Um, Colleen Murphy, in her uh, book, The Conceptual Foundations of Transitional Justice, she has this really important analytical frame. She says that what we have to know in order to, um, in order to understand the model or the approach of justice that should be applied, we have to ask in the context, what is the question of justice raised? What is the question of justice that's, array, that's raised by a particular context? And so I want to talk really quickly about six different portals or approaches to justice uh, and then talk about why I think that there is no justice question that is suitable for the kinds of conditions that we're facing. And it's important because we're in the midst of these uprisings after the death of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and uh, Breonna Taylor, say her name, and then so many others over and over again. And this is a continuing stream since Trayvon and Tamir and Eric Garner and you know Sandra Bland and Renisha McBride and Khalif Browder and so many others. There's a stream and we keep asking, there's the demand for justice 
like, and we say no justice, no peace, but what is the thing that we're actually asking for? If there is to be justice, are we actually asking for something that we can have, or should we ask, should we create energy and put it into a completely different framework? That's a possibility. So let's go back and look really quickly at uh, approaches to justice. And, and see whether the questions of justice are suitable to the case that we um, that we're considering. The first three approaches to justice are all part of these are considered in. Uh, Colleen Murphy's conceptual foundations of transitional justice, where she raises this question, provides this analysis. So these three are coming from her analysis. Retributive justice, we know well, it's a form of, you know, it's kind of the punitive form. And the question, the primary concern is creating a justification for punishment as a corrective to moral wrongdoing. The, the question of justice, what, in the context in which retributive justice is appropriate, the question is always what constitutes just treatment of a perpetrator of a criminal wrongdoing? There are all kinds of things in there. It's layered in a bunch of ways, but primarily it's focused on wrongdoing. It's, uh, as it has evolved, it is owned by the state. It is, uh, you know, trials, imprisonment. Uh, these kinds of approaches are what are what we know and people recognize and many people only understand retributive justice in this way, right? Only understand justice by thinking about retributive justice. And sometimes it's, it's curious because most of us believe that retributive justice, the punishment as a primary form is a failing act. And yet when we, when we have something like Jacob Blake getting shot in the back, uh, seven times for very suspicious reasons. Um, we, we call for justice and it's not clear if we say justice was not served because the people didn't get tried, they didn't go to jail. And other times we will say, no matter whether they get tried or go to jail, justice isn't happening in the law and order system. Justice isn't actually available. So we'll have to get some sense of clarity about the extent to which retribution, imprisonment, trials owned by the state are a proper portal to justice. Uh, I kind of uh, follow the Angela Davis abolitionist um, theoretical, which says that we can't, when the justice that we seek is not here in this trial and retribution form. So there are certainly limitations to retributive justice, and particularly for this case. Let's keep in mind the case that we're talking about, structural racism, uh, historical harms. Retributive justice may or may not suit even part of what's needed and certainly not sufficiently holistic on its own to address and redress those issues. Corrective justice is more like, like a thing of torts law and things like that, where there's unjust enrichment, where somebody loses because of an individual action, but it's more uh, suited to individual cases of wrongdoing. And, and then you have you know, trials and fines and, um, and payments, compensation, that kind of thing uh, in trial court, uh, verdicts of sorts. Um, for personal injury or property damage and things like that. And those are based on individual actions and transactions. And so certainly that is a way too limited of a scope to even consider when we think about undoing structural harm and racism. Distributive justice, some think this may have some, you know, may have some merit because distributive justice is about establishing or restoring the proper distribution of goods at the societal level. So material goods, 
symbolic goods, epistemic goods, access to uh, access to positions and real estate and jobs and uh, you know education and those kinds of things. And so, using policy, legal action, economic and educational practices to try and top up or try and create societal level distribution kind of the inverse of retributive justice at the societal level, if you only have societal claims and some of those individual direct harms will never be addressed. But it also is a question of what are the goods that are trying to be distributed and how do those get distributed in ways that account for all of those invisible, intangible results of the assaults that have happened and the compounding impacts, particularly when some of those eventually are in some ways contributed to by people who may have once been victims and are now perpetrators in that cycle of victimhood and violence and some who are acting internally against themselves as part of that cycle of victimhood and violence. How, if at all, does a distributive justice framework apply to that? I think there are a lot of limitations and there will be challenges. So then let's look at the other three, the cases that most of us are most excited about. Restorative justice, transformative justice, and healing justice are three areas that uh, I think are worth considering. So restorative justice, we have a sense of this. This is the thing about restorative justice. Um, is we don't all have a shared definition of it, but there are there's a shared sense of kind of there's some coalescing around a set of values, restorative values. So if you ask, even if you don't have a shared definition, if you have shared values. So Howard Zayer describes uh, the restorative values as being respect, relationships, and responsibility. That's how he would frame what restorative, what, what makes an action or a, an intervention restorative. Kay Pranis expands on that a bit. She talks about it being about participation, respect, transparency, interconnectedness, accountability, healing, empathy, and spirituality as central values that guide practices or make restorative justice practice or make practices restorative. So you've got three R's, you've got seven values, and then Braithwaite, um, he doesn't have just values, he has categories of values. So he talks about constraining values, like how do we focus on things like empowerment, non-domination, respectful listening, equal concern. The second category is maximizing values, the restoration of human dignity, the restoration of damaged human relationships, community restoration, the restoration of compassion or the environment, the pursuit of freedom, and providing the social support to develop human capabilities to their fullest. And then the third category is emergent values, so remorse for injustice, censoring the act, forgiveness, mercy. So uh, for Braithwaite, he would look for some combination, a matrix that combines or reflects some combination of these three categories to determine the level of, rest, of restorativeness that is in a practice. So that's restorative justice. And restorative justice has you know, a, a primary focus, certainly, in relationality. And what we know is that one limitation to being able to uh, affirm relationality, and what a lot of people who say restorative is not good enough because it focuses on relationships, there's nothing to restore. There were never good relations. It, it, with regard to the police, before they were officially policed, they were slave catchers and property protectors, and they've never been uh, even organized. The narrative of the police force has never been something that uh, is designed to encourage the full flourishing of individuals and 
and to affirm freedom-seeking behaviors. Rather, it's designed to, con to constrain freedom-seeking behaviors and to prioritize property over people in many instances. And so there are some of the critiques of restorative justice are that there may not be anything to restore. And there's also the case that relationships are important. And so how, if at all, particularly when those restorative uh, programs are situated inside of institutional contexts that have a deeply embedded racialized violence, the edu public education system, the uh, criminal justice system, the healthcare system, any number of places where there's continuing racialized differentiation, is restorative justice properly framed in ways that allow it to ask and approach the kinds of structural reimagination? And can we not work on restoring relationships until the systems, and you don't restore relationships with systems anyway, you restore relationships with people and then you dismantle the system. So is restorative justice properly positioned to do that? That's a question. I think there are probably some limitations. A number of people who have said that um, restorative justice isn't sufficient have called for transformative justice, are calling for and promoting now transformative justice. So what is this transformative justice? Uh, according to Generation 5, um, in, in a document that they have that's called Toward Transformative Justice. They say transformative justice seeks to provide people who experience violence, actually I'm quoting right now, I should say I'm quoting from Generation 5's Towards Transformative Justice uh, framework. They say transformative justice seeks to provide people who experience violence with immediate safety long-term healing and reparations while holding people who commit violence accountable within and by their communities. This accountability includes stopping immediate abuse, making a commitment to not engage in future abuse, offering reparations for the past, and such accountability requires ongoing support and transformative healing for the people in this instance, who's sexually abused. So a lot of the transformative justice work is being articulated from the perspective of those in, in, in cases of intimate partner violence, direct violence, sexual violence, and that sphere. And uh, so again, transformation as opposed to restoration explicitly recognizes that interpersonal forms of violence take place within context of structural conditions, including poverty, racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, and other systemic forms of violence. And so such systems cannot be trusted to intervene in the harm, which means that a lot of the transformative justice work happens in informal and unofficial systems work. Some, which means to some extent, a lot of it is not yet well documented. So we can't fully see how it works and uh, always be able to test and effectively critique some of it because it works understandably outside of those systems. Um, but it, it will require, it requires um, creating mechanisms outside of outside of the current institutional structures that are embedded and fused with structural racism. One of the challenges, this is personal, I hope somebody will correct me on this. One of the challenges when I'm looking at transformative justice practices is that sometimes when a person who has experienced violence themselves don't wish to pursue a claim of sorts, because the violence happened within a community, the community can take that and say, well, it happened in the community and so we own it. And so they will pursue the accountability with or without the uh, support 
affirmation of the person who directly experienced harm. In some ways, that's doing exactly what restorative justice would hope to do, which is inserting community and taking the state out of it. But in other ways, it's also taking over the claim from the people who were harmed, except for the fact that the community counts itself as being harmed. And so there are ways in which community accountability can be prioritized over relationality. Not sure that that's a bad thing, not sure that that's helpful, not sure that that's justice. So you've got restorative justice, you've got transformative justice, and then the third uh, modality that's currently being developed, uh, advanced, uh, moved on more so is what's called healing justice, which according to Kara Page, I'm quoting again, healing justice is a framework that identifies how we can holistically respond and intervene on generational trauma and violence and bring collective practices that can impact and transform the consequences of oppression on our bodies, hearts, and minds. Through this framework, we continue to build political philosophical convergence on healing inside of liberation movements and organizations. So the primary analysis for healing justice is those uh, embodied responses that allow for healing work to happen so that while people are advocating, they aren't continuing to do additional harm. They're they are healing themselves and working towards societal transformation, but focusing and recognizing that uh, trauma tends to be, trauma and injustice are embodied. And so we have to focus on how to, pro, how to approach justice while addressing the internal damage that it does at the embodied level. So you've got generative somatics, politicized somatic modalities, embodied philosophies, and so forth. So these are kind of the six different portals or approaches to justice that are in Avant. And I'm not sure that any of them fully address the, the needs that have been created by structural um, systemic racism and historic harm. So this is my critique of justice as a framework. Justice as a construct is what would be called an ineffective signifier. Uh, this goes to um, semiotics. Um, Uh, Ferdinand de Saussure uh, has a whole notion of semiotics. And in semiotics, you have sign, signifier, signified. So, so a signifier is a word, for instance, justice. And then justice is supposed to signify something specific so that when you say it, everybody has a shared sense of what it is that you're pointing to, right? And if not, if everybody has a shared sense, then it becomes a sign. It's an effective, an effective signifier is a sign. So for instance, in an article that Mara Schiff and I co-authored, we talk about this notion of a boat. If I say boat, you all may have slightly different imaginations. It could be a kayak, a canoe, a yacht, a tugboat, a sailboat, but boat has an essence, has an essential character which is that it's a vessel constructed with the intention of being able to carry things and float on water. That's a boat. Um, boat is distinguishable from lily pads and driftwood, even though from time to time, lily pads and driftwoods are capable of carrying things. Justice doesn't have an essence. It doesn't speak to an essence. People don't know if you're talking about a process, a product, a space in which to operate and even then not sure what it is. And so justice is an ineffective signifier. It generally has a negative epistemology, which means we generally only know justice in its absence, which is why most of the portals towards justice, most of the approaches are trying to undo 
something. We're trying to undo a harm. We're trying to undo a, an inappropriate uh, gain or loss in distributive justice and corrective justice. We're trying to repair broken relationships. So justice has a negative epistemology. We know, we don't know what it is when it's present. We know what it is when it's absent. And so it's mostly imagined retrospectively and it doesn't account for syndemic effects. So here we go, really quickly. Um, we say, no justice, no peace. As though peace building has a way to contribute to justice. And I would suggest that peace building doesn't have a way to contribute to justice because in peace building, we also say that Peace is not the absence of violence, but peace is the presence of justice. And so if justice is unspecified, then peace is also really unspecified. And we can't get to peace because we don't know exactly what this justice is, which leaves us with what I call a Peterson problem. So let me tell you all what a Peterson problem is. This is just my understanding. This is what I call it. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. I have dear friends and family that lived near Oberlin, Ohio and in Cleveland. And so sometimes we would drive from Cincinnati to Cleveland and sometimes in the way we would pass through Elyria, Ohio. And in Elyria, Ohio, right off of uh, State Highway 57, there's the, um, River Road overpass or under underpass uh, at 57 in a little strip mall. I couldn't get a picture of it, but in a little strip mall, not far from downtown Elyria, there is a shop. Mr. Peterson has a shop and it's a really unique shop because Mr. Peterson has a veterinary and taxidermy shop. And the emblem in the window is this beautiful picture of a golden retriever. And it says, Peterson's Veterinary and Taxidermy. Either way, you get your dog back. <laughs> in this pursuit of peace and justice, because justice remains unspecified, peace is probably not available either. And so we have to find a different way, a different languaging to name the thing that we are pursuing. I'm not sure that the thing that we're after as it relates to structural harm, ra racialized historical structural harm, I'm not certain that it is a justice question. And so at the Chicago Torture Justice Center, oh, these are, let me make sure I say why. It's an ineffective signifier. It often conceptualized in terms of accountability. A lot of times when we think about justice, we think about it in terms of accountability. But what do you do? Who's accountable? Who do you hold accountable when the impacts are no longer, when the systems and structures are so deeply racialized, the, are so deeply embedded with racialized assumptions and disparaging, disparate, disparately impacting racialized assumptions so that you can have pervasive racism without having an overwhelming number of active racists. We have a fair number of active racists, but we have much more racism we have, because it's built into the structures, it's built into the accountability, it's built into the narratives. And so it's built into the the structures, the systems, the narratives, the history, the folklore, the mythology, the lies, the science. Racism is deeply embedded in our science. And so while we think it's neutral, it's not. And so who do we hold accountable for that? Justice often being framed in terms of accountability has a limitation. Justice also sometimes speaks to relational repair, creating the context in which people can relate as equals, creating the context in which relationships can be uh, established or reestablished. 
if there was never a good relationship and there's nothing to repair, but even still, how do you create a space? How do you create a context in which people can be fully uh, realized on their own before they try to be in relationship? All of the multi-generational impacts and limitations have not allowed for full manifestation, for full flourishing. And so to be in relationship with somebody else with another group or another unit while you haven't experienced full flourishing, full freedom on your own is a difficult approach. And reparations or restoration, you certainly can't pay back everything that was owed for 250 years of uncompensated labor with a abuse, you know, as a kicker, as a, as a side sidekick with des with the destruction of families restoration how do you know how do you restore how do you return to what what would be wholeness because of the compounding synergistic syndemic impacts it's difficult to imagine how to even calculate what would restore and justice is largely framed retrospectively and so what might we do if we didn't approach it in a justice framework? David? This is the last turn and then I'm gonna open it. We're gonna have some questions. Hopefully there's some questions and comments yeah. and thoughts that we can play with. Um, Chicago Torture Justice Center and a network of others who are working in Chicago around creating a new context are developing a notion of politicized healing. It's the recognition that healing is political. So what happens in our bodies, in our minds, healing the spiritual and political, the, the psychic, the spiritual wounds is an act of resistance. Creating a context in which people can experience joy and share authentic love and celebrate relationality is an act of resistance. Our healing is political and our politics can be healing, which means that taking agency and advocacy, moving out and reshaping the structures and the narratives in our community, reshaping the relationships, the distribution of resources, undoing the undergirding violent structural narratives, all of that can be healing. And so our healing is political, and our politics can be healing. Heal, politicized healing addresses and it seeks to transform. So it's felt at, uh, at the individual level, at the community level, everything that's caused by historic and evolving since systems of oppression. So we can't just look back. We've got to be looking forward and creating new contexts as well and trying to not uh, Bobby Orr skate to where the puck is going. Um, and through a variety of practices. And so the, the primary three places that we act, we work to heal, to dismantle, and then to create, to create a context, to use reparative power to create a context in which full flourishing can emerge. And so politicized healing has these, uh, benefits or bonus, these values. It's nested, nested in the sense that it focuses at every level, individual, family, communities, structures, systems, and meta narratives. because systems and structures don't exist on their own. They only exist in affirmation of the undergirding cultural narratives. And so if we're trying to change the systems and structures that provided for or created space of complicity for violence uh, over these many years. We have to undo the narratives and the meta narratives, many of which are embedded in our history, mythology, folklore, lies. And so we're trying to change that. And we're addressing it at the individual family, community, structural and meta narrative level. It's also nested in time. So politicized healing looks back, we have a Sankofan approach, but we also are looking at the present and it's got a distinctly future orientation. So all of our work is future with a notion of addressing, responding to and healing a past. 
simultaneously working at the embodied relational structural and cultural level it's not siloed you don't do one and then the other and then the other you do them all simultaneously and consistently politicized healing is process and not product because the nature of the syndemic is that it the co-occurring epidemic conditions are manifesting anew every day. You can't produce something today that has value because it has, it has value from, from the way the conditions were. And we have to be constantly thinking about the way conditions are. And so this, the, because syndemics manifest and they continue to uh, produce new and different things, we have to be in process and not ever settling on a particular product. And so politicized healing is a process. It's a framework for process. And the framework is creative, at times transrational and always futurist. And we take emerging fractal and quantum approaches in the work. So the question is, when we say justice, what do we mean? What we think, what I think, what I think, this isn't Chicago Torture Justice Center. This is uh, David Anderson Hooker making a claim. What I think is that what we're hoping to create when we say justice is we're hoping to create a space, a context, we can imagine a possibility where every sentient being, person and group, experiences full, fundamentally equitable access to the relationships, resources, opportunities, structures, testimonial authority needed to fully manifest individual collective capabilities in support of a greater and common good. That's what I mean. And that I'm not certain that that's what we all mean when we say justice. And so what's the wording? What's the paradigm? What's the framing that we have to use for something as difficult to address as complex and evolving as structural, systemic uh, racism and historical harms, the multi-layered, multi-generational historical harms that they've caused. So um, that's, my, that's my thinking, that's where I am with this, and um, I'd love to get your feedback. Yes, thank you, David, for, for excellent, raising a whole lot of questions, and we do have some in the, in the chat box. So I'm going to go to Pam Rojas first, if you'd like to unmute her, Abby, and, and allow, allow her to speak. Or maybe I can unmute her. Hello, everyone. Hi there. My name is Pam Rojas. I'm calling you from Chile in South America. Uh, Dr. Hooker, I wanted to hear some of your thoughts, a few considerations, a few words on uh, what you could maybe say to those people who have been a product of war, such as myself. I'm a product of, of, uh, of the dictatorship in Chile. And, and um, after there were reparations and tortured, and when you mentioned all of those heinous crimes at the beginning of this session, I could mm -hmm. totally relate on a first, on a very speak about reparations. When, when, when there were reparations, there were also a moment when those um, military personnel who did the torturing, they also ended up receiving reparations. And so when we're trying to undo historical harm for the past, I wanted to put this in the same perspective of the police veteran charged in George Floyd's killing, Chauvin, where maybe in the future, if there are reparations, do you think that that police officer who um, was charged in uh, George Floyd's killing, if he would also be... Um, in a situation where he would receive reparations because undoubtedly everyone in, who lives in a system of violence, in a cycle of violence, is a victim in one way or another. And so um, if you could please talk about 
uh, the syndemic oppression and reparations of trying to address historical harm. That, that is really helpful. So one of the things um, I, thank you. I, have, I have the benefit of, thank you for that question, I have the benefit of some exposure to the Chilean case because one of the members of the board of the Chicago Torture Justice Center um, is also, um, he is Chilean and has, has shared some of your experience and came here and is working at one of the other torture justice centers. By the way, there are multiple torture justice centers in the United States. Uh, Chicago's the only one that's based internally looking at uh, police violence, racially motivated police violence in the United States. But there are a number of other centers because torture is something that happens worldwide as a regular practice. Dehumanizing activities is just a way that people find to engage. And so, um, so thank you for that case. The, what happens, the reason that we talk about politicized healing as being emergent and fractal is because it's constantly evolving, but it's also fractal. Um, most people know, kind of have a sense of what fractals are. Uh, I, I, but usually when we think of a fractal, we think of it as just as a self-repeating shape. Like in a snowflake, every smaller, smaller component of the snowflake has the exact same shape as every larger and larger component. But what technically makes something a fractal is that the relational value between every component is consistent. I know you all didn't come on here for a mathematics lesson, so that might get past you. Let me say it again. What makes something a fractal is that the relational value between each component is consistent. What does that mean for us? It means that in the way that we do our work, our relational values have to be the same at the individual, at the relational, at the uh, communal level. It doesn't look the same, but it has to be the same. Which then means that a to, to properly structure a reparations framework, you would have to structure it in ways that give people the relationships, resources, uh, structures, testimonial authority that they need to survive, to thrive, to manifest their full capabilities. And so while some will need psychosocial supports and economic supports and kind of political supports to feel like they fully belong. Others actually need psychological support to address the damage done from the notion of supremacy. Like if you've formed an identity around a notion of supremacy, be that whiteness or a nationalist supremacy, when that gets threatened or upended by some level of equality, when the peasants become equal to other people, when they have to be given equal rights, then it disrupts and psychologically damages certain people. They need support. Perpetrators actually need support. It's not the same support. You don't give everybody the same support, but in creating reparations, they actually have to get some kind of care so that they don't continue their own cycles of victimhood and violence and continue contributing Eventually, the world is global. You can't, um, you can't extract or remove people from the world. Sometimes what we do is we just take them from one place and put them in another, which is problematic. So you've got to find a way to create them so that they can be um, a useful, productive, contributory part of the society where they are, which means that they may have to get a different kind of uh, support or a different kind of care and treatment, but I would consider all of that as part of a reparations package. So part of our reparations package in Chicago has to include kind of uh, nonviolence, de-escalation, racial, uh, racial awareness training for police officers who have been embedded deeply with a level of, some of them with a level of white supremacy. That's part of the reparations package as well. Great. So, so there's a number of questions about kind of 
d distinguishing and, and, and if it's possible to do, mul and you kind of answered this in your last response, but kind of possible to co combine restorative, transformative, and healing justice in ways, and what does that look like? And I think that's what you've, you're pointing to in terms of in terms of towards the end of your conversation. So given all this lack of consensus about even those terminologies that you had up on those slides, right. how do we then convince others to, that, that a combination of those is possible? Yeah, and this, it, it will be a question because the, the, the difference in the prioritization of relationships and, and structural advocacy or structural dismantling between restorative and transformative justice is sometimes, as it's practiced, stark. There are some restorative justice practitioners that recoil at the notion that our proper response is to banish people from communities. I always, when I was at work, when I was on the faculty at Eastern Mennonite, I was always, I, I just shuddered at the idea that in the Mennonite confession of faith, shunning is still a legitimate practice. And so for, for some, that's just not a, it's just not an acceptable possible outcome. And so the commitment to relationality is so deeply embedded that, it find, that people will find it hard to coexist with those who are willing to shun as a part of, as a mechanism for accountability. If there's a way to kind of, uh, bring those together, that would be, that, that's worth having a real conversation about. Uh, I think healing justice, because it's an embodied approach, can be in part of all of them. But I'm not sure, because justice still talks about accountability. And I think that for most, restorative, transformative healing, there's still this notion of accountability. And there's so much of what's happening with historical historicized racism and racialized harm that no one can be held accountable for anymore in the sense that they didn't do it. They're perpetuating it. They're responding to it there. But in a grander scheme of things, there's a certain kind of accountability that is, has to be systemic and not individual. And so how do we articulate that? And transformative, restorative, and healing justice have not fully articulated that piece. And so that's a part that I'm really interested in. If somebody wants to talk about how do we do systemic dismantling, not accountability, there's no reason to hold a system accountable because that suggests that you will reform it or try to redeem it. And so some of these systems just have to be completely dismantled, abolished. The whole narrative of policing probably has to change you know, completely. So the notion of reforming that system is in and of itself problematic. And so I'm not sure that it's a integrated notion. I, I still imagine it may be a completely new framing outside of a justice paradigm. Interesting. But I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Um, I'm gonna, um, if, if people are willing, we've got another question and I'm gonna just let uh, Damon Lynch jump in and ask. Oh yeah, Damon Lynch is gonna jump in. Really? Is he, is he muted? Hi, yeah, hi, Professor Hooker. Uh, great talk, thank you. Um, I'll try to keep this as brief as I can, and I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, whether I'm right or wrong, what I had in my mind was we're predominantly talking about people who don't have much power. And there's a part of me which is very resistant to applying these processes to people that have all the power in the world, all the social, political, and economic power in the world. For example, you know, the example that keep on coming up in my mind is a case like the West County Toxics Coalition near Berkeley and Chevron. You know, I, there's a part of me that definitely wants to see those corporate executives go to prison for what they did over decades. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's just me. But... Um, I don't want to see restorative justice or transformative justice in the way that it's been presented this afternoon, because I think some of those things that you're talking about, I'd like to see that take place through just an ordinary political process in parallel with sending corporate executives to prison. Mm -hmm. 
not only to account for the wrong that they did, but to deter these things happening again in future. And I'm sure I'm not the only person to think of this. Um, it's probably something you've confronted yourself. So I'd love to hear your ideas about this kind of thing when we're talking about very powerful people. Yeah, this is the thing. Um, if you actually support abolition, if, if prisons are obsolete, if prisons as a construct are to be abolished, then we can't rely on them for those instances where it feels good to us. We have to demonstrate what is possible. Is, is it possible? Maybe, maybe prisons aren't obsolete. Maybe we should always have a um, structure that is rife and, and primed for abuse, but that can be used to marginalize people in society. And just depending on who gets to call the shots, somebody gets to be marginalized. I think that that's always going to be problematic. I absolutely have an urge in my body. You know, since corporations are people, I think that a bunch of corporations ought to be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. I'm okay with that. Except how do we construct a society where that, because it's not just the prison as an institution, it's the carceral mentality that gives permission for the other to be punished, for the other to be abused on behalf of our moral values. Is there any way other than the furtherance of our moral commitment that doesn't necessarily allow abuse, but still creates spaces for accountability and that kind of thing. So I, I get the urge to send to prison and we say, well, while we've got the system now, let's use this system now. And then when we change it, we'll then we'll think of something else to do with them. But the trick is that a hundred years from now started yesterday, right? And so if we're trying to change carceral narratives, which is a narrative transformation, which often will take two or three generations, sometimes to be fully in effect, we have to begin that now. The, the, the future actually began a moment ago. And so we have to start thinking about what are the other possibilities of ways of doing this work even now where we can undo the carceral logic and still create spaces for accountability um, and a shared uh, future, creating spaces for a shared future, which is why when I say every sentient being, I'm also saying that we have to do work that accounts for an environment, um, which is part of our ecology and so our work has to create spaces for an environment to flourish as well. I don't think that's satisfying, but I, 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 get the, I get the impulse and I still think we have to wrestle with how do we undo the carceral logic that has gotten us into the conditions that we're in right now. So, so I know we're, we're kind of over time, but I'm, I'm kind of... Oh. If you're okay to, to, to take another one, I've got, uh, I, I feel particularly moved because I have a student of mine who's asked a question, who's in a transitional justice class that I'm teaching this, okay. uh, this fall. And, and her question is, is around, you know, can justice and healing still be achieved for victims without confrontation? And she was particularly thinking of your context of the Chicago Torture Center and the fact that this, um, Chief Burge or Chief, Police Officer Burge has passed away, right? And so the perp, one of the main perpetrators is no longer there, right? Um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. So justice, is justice being achieved um, with confrontation, without confrontation? This was the, you know, this was, and in a transitional justice course, you're thinking about things like truth and reconciliation commissions and those kinds of dialogues and things like that. And I even think that in the space of transitional justice where you've got like collective wrongdoing and pervasive inequity and 
precarity, the kinds of structural precarity that would call for transitional justice. Encounter is interesting, but encounter, if the encounter is the only way to achieve a context in which people can fully flourish, then justice may not be available. If justice isn't available, is there still the possibility of creating a context in which people can fully flourish? Because at the end of the day, what people need is the context in which they can fully flourish. And if we don't call that justice, then we don't call, then justice may not be available and justice may not be the thing that people seek. I hear people, Carolyn Yoder and some other folks talk about creative forms of justice when the people aren't, you know, available to be engaged. Somebody has died. They're not, you can't talk to them. You can't encounter them. Can you achieve justice? And there are people who set harms in motion that have been dead for seven generations and uh, they'll never be either known or encountered. And so I'm still wondering how do we create a future? How do we create a context for today that then validates the harm of the past? Because a lot of what was harmful in the past, people say, well, that was just the context in which it happened. People were just people of their time, but they were people of their time because that narrative hasn't shifted. We have to shift the narrative and say that even then it was wrong. And so how do we do that? We do that by projecting both a future this is the quantum notion, has that retro occurrence. And so you do something now that has an impact on the history and on the future. And so I think that this context is available. I don't know if justice is available, but I still think it's possible to create a context in which people can experience the relationships, resources, structures, the type of testimonial authority that they need to move through the compounding nature of structural racism and historic harm. And I think that some of it is being articulated in this process that we're currently talking about as politicized healing. And so I hope you all will take a look at it. And if you have any other thoughts and wanna share those with us, we are certainly interested because we're in the middle of trying to figure it out. Yes, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And, and thank you so much for, for uh, kind, of, kind of opening up our conference with such a thought-provoking presentation and a set of ideas. These, these, I just wanna remind people that these themes and ideas are gonna be continuing in our discussions through September, talking into na about narrative in October and polarization after the elections in November. So this, this is gonna be an ongoing, ongoing conversation. Hey, Jeremy, a couple of people popped in the chat to ask. And so I'm easy to find at the University of Notre Dame, dhooker at nd.edu. dhooker at ndnotredame.edu is the easiest place to find me. Feel free to reach out. Great. There it is. Yeah. And, and thank you, Michael, for throwing that in there. Yeah. Um, let me just say, and I was actually going to say just thank you again. And if, if others want to just, if we want to just unmute everybody and people can either clap or, or use your reaction on the Zoom to, to show a clap, right? <laughs> so thank you, David, for your time and, and, and resources. Glad to do it. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Be well. Yeah. I'll just okay. join you again for some other parts of the conference, for I sure. Hope so. Yeah, I hope all so. Right. Excellent. Abby, you're going to stick around, right? For a sec. Yeah, cool. Thank you all. You can probably stop recording if you want to. <laughs> I actually also have the button if you want me to do